Our next panel is about to discuss uh, judicial conduct and misconduct. I know it's a catchy topic, but uh, it, there's a lot that has to be talked about, and the judges have a lot of limitations on what they can and cannot say and what they can and cannot do. And this panel of experts, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not even going to do an in introduction because we're, we're already starting late and there's a lot of information, but I just want to thank you um, for your time, and I'm passing it off to you. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Um, hello, hello. Well, hello, hello. Well, thank you, um, Deborah. Uh, I'm I'm Chip Becker. I'm a lawyer here in Philadelphia, and I'm really honored to be with uh, Judge Cynthia Roof of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and also Melissa Norton, who is the Chief Counsel of the Judicial Conduct Board for the Commonwealth of um, Pennsylvania. And um, I think that it falls to me to at least start us off for a little bit. So um, so let me just say that uh, Judge Roof is going to uh, share with all of us um, her thoughts and um, and wisdom about how the federal judiciary uh, uh, regulates itself from a judicial conduct and misconduct standpoint. And Melissa Norton knows more about any more than anyone about how the judges of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania um, are subject to a separate uh, a system of judicial regulation. Um, am I? Did I get that about right between the between the two of you? I think so. Okay. Well, good. Okay. So let me just <laughs> so let me so let me just say briefly at the at the at the outset. Uh, well, let me just say briefly who I am as kind of bears on this conversation. So I'm I'm a lawyer, uh, and I think all of you know that lawyers are subject to um, rules of dis rules of professional discipline. Uh, or rules of professional conduct that are enforceable by disciplinary boards that in Pennsylvania are are created by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, and that's typical throughout the country. That every Supreme Court uh, uh, regulates the practice of law, uh, that is to say, regulates the lawyers who practice in those courts. And every court has a disciplinary board, and every disciplinary board has the capacity to. Um, uh, investigate and to uh, sanction lawyers who violate the rules of professional conduct that um, uh, that govern in that particular jurisdiction. So it it turns out um, that there is a for judges there is a parallel system less well known um, and generally less used, but but still a parallel system of 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 discipline. Uh, for for when judges are uh, put are are alleged to have um, acted inconsistent with their office, and so in that regard, um, let me just say about myself that I also am a judge of the Pennsylvania Court of Judicial Discipline, and and Ms. Norton will talk about this at great length. But as I mentioned, Pennsylvania has its own parallel system for for the regulation of judicial conduct and misconduct. And I'll just say, just by way of briefly summarizing, and this is pursuant to our constitution, it is in the Pennsylvania constitution itself, we have a, uh, a judicial conduct board. And again, Melissa Norton is in charge of that, which is which investigates uh, judicial conduct, um, which can work with judges on their conduct um, and can charge judges for misconduct. And when the Judicial Conduct Board decides to charge, they charge in the court, in the court of judicial discipline. And I am appointed by the governor along with a number of other people throughout the Commonwealth to adjudicate those issues. And we, uh, the court of judicial discipline can do anything from exonerating the judge to uh, reprimanding the judge, to removing the judge from office, to even taking away the judge's pension. Uh, if there if there is a pension there, and those decisions in turn are reviewed or reviewable by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, um, even even individual justices of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania are subject to the review, to the adjudication, to the power of of my court. Um, although our decisions are reviewed by the Supreme Court as a whole, so Pennsylvania has a actually has a very robust system of of judicial. Uh, of, of evaluating judicial conduct and misconduct. And the reason I, I sort of summarize that at the outset is because for, for your purposes, uh, for everyone who is participating in this uh, in this exercise today, and, and Debbie, let me just say again, thank you for doing this. It's just a fantastic program that PMC does um, for the benefit of so many people. Um, the, the first and foremost thing that I want to convey to you is that is that there is a system like this 
in every jurisdiction. The federal courts has its own particular feature. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, Delaware, California, my, you know, Wyoming, all 50 states, they all have a system that looks something like this. And uh, it is not, it is not just a, it's not just an ethical system, right? Uh, uh, there's a code of judicial conduct that says judges should be impartial, judges should be competent, judges should not be engaged in politics, things of that nature. It's not just a philosophical system, it's actually a procedural system. It is, uh, 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 depending on the depending on the jurisdiction, a a, a real uh, process that that the judges can go through, and sometimes there's greater or lesser degrees of public input. Um, so I just want to urge all of you, in w- wherever it is that you live, and wherever it is that you 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 you, you practice, that you uh, be uh, mindful that it's that it's worth figuring out. Uh, again, whether it's Pennsylvania, California, or somewhere in between, exactly what the system looks like for adjudicating questions of judicial conduct uh, and misconduct. Again, let me emphasize, it's not just a system of ethics and conduct. It's actually a system of procedure that is capable of adjudicating these things, and in some cases, actually imposing very significant sanctions. So, uh, uh, so check the jurisdiction. That's sort of my one, my one big point. And as a corollary point, I'll just uh, remind you, and I think this observation was made earlier today, that um, that if you're trying to figure out, well, what is the system of of of, of for judicial conduct or misconduct in a state, um, and these would be statewide systems, that it may be the case that the courts themselves have have a way of helping you with that. Many courts, certainly Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, where I practice, many courts have have spokespeople have have uh, people who interface with the press. Um, and uh, they're not going to tell you, of course, necessarily what a court what the court's going to do in a given case, but they can be often very helpful in explaining how the courts work. So uh, uh, I mean, you can do your own research. There may be lawyers or judges who can explain this to you separately, but it may be also be the case that you can simply reach out to the courts themselves and and get some resources on how the system of judicial conduct and misconduct uh, operates in whatever in whatever the jurisdiction is. So there's one other thought that I wanted to offer before I, I hand the baton off, I guess, to, to Judge Roof, who will talk, um, uh, and, and, and there's a lot to talk about in terms of how the federal courts regulate themselves with respect to judicial conduct. And of course, it's, it's an issue that many people have been thinking about. Um, but I wanted to uh, uh, think just out loud about Professor Watson's uh, observation in the last session, that um, how we feel about the judges, and maybe we have we, we're, we're more attuned to the judges. We know more about the judges because of technology and the internet and things of that nature. But but I heard Professor Watson to say that how we feel about the judges individually can inform how we feel how we feel about their decisions and how we feel about the institutions in which they work. And the way that I just have distilled that in, um, uh, in my own mind is that uh, people believe in the robe or want to believe in the robe. Uh, but people will believe in the robe uh, and the power and the dignity that that the robe represents only if they believe if the people who wear it. Um, the the enormous credibility, the enormous faith, the enormous trust, the enormous power that we that we repose in our judiciary is is in some deep way uh, entirely a function of our trust and respect in the people who who uh, who occupy those offices. And um, and so these questions of judicial ethics. Uh, are um, uncommon in terms of how they arise. Um, uh, you know, ju- most judges are, are good people and they're hardworking and, and it's, it's, it's really in the grand scheme of things really not very often that we find ourselves focusing specifically on issues of judicial ethics or, or, or lack of ethics. But those issues are, are profoundly corrosive when they occur. And it reminds me, and it should remind all of us, that these questions of conduct and misconduct and ethics, really, uh, 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 how, how, however seldom they arise in the news, go um, to the heart of the judicial project. And I'll just offer one other thought, uh, and, and Judge Roof, you may have some observations about this as well, that to the extent that the United States um, has been looked to throughout its history as a source of uh, inspiration, wisdom, and practical uh, advice about how to run a constitutional form of government, um, and to the extent that uh, people around the world look up to our courts, 
these systems of ethics, these systems, uh, uh, these procedural systems, not just the ethical codes of conduct, but the, the, me the mechanics by which we regulate and enforce um, uh, judicial conduct and misconduct um, it, it has, has global implications. Right, because whether we are whether we in the United States are doing a good job or a bad job is something that people notice all over the world, and we have the opportunity to be, as has been the case for this country for a long time now, we have the opportunity to be a source of inspiration, and we also have the opportunity to uh, to, for for one of a better phrase, to drag everyone down. So these issues are important for our constitutional system, our sense of self, but they, uh, because of the position of the country and the position of our courts, the respect that our courts have, have deep implications for the, for the world as a whole, I would submit. So with all of that, let me um, again introduce Judge, uh, Judge Roof. Um, uh, Deborah, you mentioned Judge Roof earlier as someone who has had a very deep experience in multi-district litigation, which is an, an enormously complex area of procedure in the federal courts, and she's been um, uh, just a, a, a great federal judge in our community for a, a very long time. So, Judge Roof, um, thank you, to you very much. That's very kind of both you, Deb, and you, um, Charles. And I want uh, it known that in each of my judicial roles, because I was a state court common pleas judge in Bucks County before I came here, and I've been judging now for about 30 years between the two courts, I have always thought that the most complex and most difficult matters were those involving the human beings in front of me. And you hope that the parties, the lawyers, and the public understand that. You never really know because there's often criticism of your decisions. But one of the things I've always felt is if you have a fair and open forum, where everyone has an opportunity to participate. That gives even the losers, if there are losers in any case, um, an opportunity to access justice. Most of us judges want to be perceived that way. Every now and then you get a notice or a comment, thank you, I may have lost my case, but you gave me my day in court. It's an amazing statement from a pro se litigant suing a prison uh, after a jury trial. And, you know, we know somebody's been affected, even though he didn't win his case. And yet, you don't see that in the newspaper. You don't see that on the internet. You do see major decisions. And yes, my MDL cases, I've had four multi-district litigations, they do involve multi-billion dollars of damages, um, product liability and antitrust. And it's very complicated, legally complicated and humanly complicated because there's individuals in every case and you try to look at that as well as what the defendants and the plaintiffs are all going through, whether they're corporations or individuals. I think we all take it very seriously, but if we should err, if we should do something that violates an ethical code, we're going to be found out. And that's because we are regulated by a judicial body called the Judicial Conference. The Judicial Conference, by the way, is the agency within the judiciary, the federal judiciary, that um, has a rather large role in our conduct and in our reform of ethics. And they administer the laws that Congress has passed regarding judicial ethics. In administering those laws, the Judicial Conference has the statutory power to set up rules and procedures that govern both judges and Supreme Court justices. And you hear that there are no ties and binds on Supreme Court justices, but there actually are. And uh, it is by statute that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court chairs this body, which comprises the chief judges from the circuit courts of appeals, there are 11 circuits, um, and the chief judges from the district courts within each circuit. And there are 94 district courts. So this is a rather large group. You could call it as almost as large as the Senate. Now, the Judicial Conference was established by Congress 
1922, which is how it derives its authority to do this. And it meets twice a year to consider policy issues that affect the judiciary, including ethical issues, as I said. They amended the um, Judicial Code of Conduct in 2019, following allegations from judicial law clerks that the federal judiciary needed to do more to protect against workplace harassment. And we have a whole new set of rules and regulations that must guide us in determining workplace conduct, which is extremely important, which here before that, we thought, oh, I didn't personally think, but everybody says judges can police themselves. You can solve these problems within the circuit, within the district court. But these problems were sometimes allegations of violations of civil rights laws. Not criminal laws per se, but civil rights laws, as you would in any workplace expect these to apply. And now very much a similar code is imposed in our workplace and it's only worked for the better. So in the recent statement on ethics principles and practices, the power of this group, the Judicial Conference, is crystal clear and the Supreme Court has long abided by it. It's headed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So um, the Chief Justice's recent public statement that more needs to be done on Supreme Court ethics signals an important opening for this Judicial Conference which has been the judiciary's rule setter in many of these areas. And I think that they have a healthy leadership role here, but it doesn't seem enough with the um, criticisms that have um, more recently become vociferous as if every judge is tainted, as if every judge has a label, as if every judge is designated as uh, the same philosophy as the president that appointed them. That couldn't be further from the truth. When we take an oath and we put on a robe, it changes everything. Just like when jurors are selected, many reluctantly, and they take their oath to serve in any particular case, they sit up straighter and they abide by the rules and the law as the judge tells them the law exists. It is an amazing process that the court can impart to everyone involved in a case. One of the big problems in our society today, in any court, state and federal, is that the public doesn't often come in to watch us. Well, they couldn't during COVID, but neither does the press and we miss you. When I was in state court as a practitioner, a public defender, and then uh, in private practice, the local press was there and sometimes more uh, than local press was there for big cases, for important cases, or sometimes just sitting in the back watching a slew of guilty pleas, which were handled jointly, and then sentencing. It made all of us in the courtroom, even the attorneys know that we have to do well, we have to do better. And it makes the judges know that somebody's watching. So we're not Judge Judy espousing uh, comments about someone's intellectual capacity. It may be funny, but it's not done in my court anyway. I can only speak for myself. But um, there's also many acts. And uh, I have provided a listing, three PowerPoint, of the acts that command what we do here. Um, the Ethics and Government Act of 1978 enumerates the types, and this is on disclosure, enumer enumerates the types of information members of the federal judiciary are required to disclose and prescribes the methods by which to report that information. Specifically, judicial officers must annually report any property interests, income, investments, liabilities, and gifts, except for food and lodging and entertainment received as personal hospitality of an individual that needs not be reported. This exception has been used most notably by the Supreme Court to conceal the receipt 
I don't know about concealing it, but it wasn't reportable by them of certain gifts that objectively might place a justice's impartiality into question. I am not here to talk about that or to opine about it, but I do not want to ignore that that is part and parcel of Congress's need in their mind to have even more rules imposed on all the federal judges. I want you to know what I as a district judge appointed through Article Three, along the same appointment process that the appellate courts and the Supreme Court go through, I must comply with the financial disclosure report every single year, May 15th. There are also multiple other reports. If you have traveled and been the recipient to speak at a conference, you must report it. We do. We've never done otherwise. Um, the food and lodging exception is uh, not going to get us out of saying, I attended the Bar Association, local Bar Association's annual conference. I sat on a panel. So this is what they gave me, one night's room and meals. We say that. We don't get paid to do that. We do that as a public service and a professional responsibility. But we also report it. We don't want anyone to think and this is where the law helps the public understand us better. We don't want anyone to think that we're on the dole because we're not, and we still don't make what we should. But we'll put aside pay and benefits for the moment. That's not part of today because today it's judicial independence as impacted by judicial ethics, new acts, reporting, and what we do every day which, of course, is being dependent on the power of the purse, which is Congress is giving us a budget. We can't raise our own money. We can't raise an army if we needed it. We are sitting ducks trying to defend the constitutional democracy that our courts are embedded with. The Judicial Conference of the United States, in an attempt to end disclosure circumvention, uh, updated its policies to exclude other um, and other exemptions, um, but it broadens the information that is to be reported, addresses a chief concern of the federal judiciary regarding disclosures, and its purpose is to eradicate influence peddling over the judiciary by interested third parties. An additional check on the federal judiciary includes the enactment recently of the Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act, also known as CETA, C-E-T-A. And this is under reforms. CETA amends the Ethics and Government Act of 1978 and requires judges to make more timely and accessible disclosures of their financial hold holdings and potential conflicts of interest. More specifically, CETA requires federal judicial officers, bankruptcy judges, magistrate judges also, to file reports within 45 days after a purchase, sale, or exchange that exceeds $1,000 in stocks, bonds, commodities, futures, and other forms of securities. And it also directs the Administrative Office of the United States Court to establish a searchable internet internet database of judicial financial disclosure reports. My annual financial disclosure reports and every judge like me has its personal financial information posted on the internet available to all. Yeah, they've taken my home address off of it. That's about it. And you won't get my social security number on it either, but there you go. I don't even own one stock, but my husband does and that must be reported. If a child lives with me and they own it, that must be reported. Furthermore, the Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act of 2023, a different act, is a pending piece of legislation that's originated in the Senate and it modifies the ethical standards, financial disclosure reports and requirements and recusal requirements that apply to Supreme Court justices. Why? Because it already applies to me. In particular, the bill would require the Supreme Court to, among other things, adopt rules governing 
the disclosure of gifts, travel, and income received by the justices and law clerks that are at least as rigorous as the House and Senate disclosure rules, and establish procedural rules requiring each party or amicus to disclose any gift, income, or reimbursement. And there's um, other matters that are pending in Congress. There is a perennial attempt to impose an inspector general bill, which may not be counting our money, uh, but is counting how many days, how many hours, how many minutes we actually are sitting in court and working, and putting that into a statistical database to somehow ascertain whether or not we really need the budget that we pray for every year. I'm a past president of the Federal Judges Association and we're very involved in um, increase in benefits and adequate pay. And sometimes we differ with our own administrative office and our judicial conference and have to sue for it. Um, we have been successful in that regard in at least establishing a COLA restoration back in 2014. And we do get a COLA now, even though Congress wouldn't award it to us before. That could change in a skinny minute. We have Congress and um, some agencies looking at us like we're um, uh, flush with money and we are not. And I wonder how all of this is accounted for in increasing our disclosure responsibilities, which we already do. I can't think of anyone else that I give all this information to. I think the IRS doesn't even want it. So I have questions about how far this should go, but I don't take a position, and I want that clear, on any of the pending legislation. If it's past legislation, I must abide by it. As administered by the Judicial Conference, we work in tandem with the uh, Article I and Article II branches of government. We're Article III. So we respect laws, we enforce laws here. I could go on and on, but I'm gonna wait for questions later because I think that there's uh, ethical considerations that go into many of the systems that each the federal and the state courts have created for discipline when there are transgressions. So I'll turn it back to you, Chip. Yeah, well, Judge Roof, I just want to follow up with one question to you. I just want, uh, can you clarify, please, whether the Ethics and Government Act and the Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act apply to all federal judicial officers, including the Supreme Court justices? The new legislation or the old? The, ex the existing legislation, the old legislation. It does not apply to the Supreme Court justices, although they have been complying with it. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have to do the same reports that I do. Okay. And the new legislation, the pending legislation, would would bring all it of that into the, the Supreme, Supreme Court, Court itself. Yeah, it targets the Supreme Court Okay, for that very reason. Okay, got it. Thank That's you. That's just a factual response. <laughs> all right. No, I understand. But just to clarify that that's, that's sort of what, that's what this new legislation is doing. Absolutely. Uh, Melissa. Yes. Okay. So um, <laughs> I, can I, I'm wondering how much time I have because I will try to gear my presentation by that. We still have 30 minutes left on left. Okay, great. Panel. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I, I'm Melissa Norton. I'm chief counsel of the Pennsylvania Judicial Conduct Board. Um, so the Pennsylvania Judicial Conduct Board has jurisdiction, for lack of a better word, over all Pennsylvania judges, no federal judges. So we go from um, the, the, <laughs> the lowest on the, on the scale of judges, starting with the magisterial district judges, all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court justices are within the Judicial Conduct Board's jurisdiction. So just briefly about the Judicial Conduct Board, um, let's see, I'll, if you could go to the next slide, please, I'd appreciate that. The Judicial Conduct Board came about by um, a constitutional amendment in 1993, and we are not going to the next slide, but I can just do this without. 
1993, there was an amendment to the, there it is, Pennsylvania Constitution, and it created the Judicial Conduct Board as well as the Court of Judicial Discipline, which um, Attorney Becker spoke to you about. If I slip and refer to him as Judge Becker, that is because he is an appointed judge on the Court of Judicial Discipline, which is my trial court. Um, so in 1993, uh, Pennsylvania started a two-tier system. In the United States, there are seven states, including Pennsylvania, that have a two-tier system. What that means is you've got a judicial conduct board that receives and investigates complaints about judicial conduct. And then you've got a court of judicial discipline that will be our trial court should we um, find a matter that we believe needs to be resolved by a court. Our appellate court then is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. If you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, Melissa, I'm sorry for interrupting, yes, but if, I, I'm just sort of picking up on a comment that I saw. Could you talk about the, just briefly about the confidential nature of what you do in your sort of prosecutorial investigatory function versus the openness uh, of the docket when a case comes before the Court of Judicial Discipline itself? Absolutely. So pursuant to the Constitution, everything that the Judicial Conduct Board does is required to be confidential. We don't have a choice in that matter. And I know that frustrates the media and, I understand, and the public, and I understand that completely, but it's in the Constitution. Um, so we keep our work confidential. The only time our work is no longer confidential is if we file a complaint in the Court of Judicial Discipline, and then it becomes a public matter uh, and the docket is available online. If you go on to the Court of Judicial Disciplines website, you can, you can uh, click on any number of cases. And you can see all the current cases. I think you can see all the way back to about maybe 2014. And then beyond, older than that, you have to go into the archives. So I think that requires a phone call or an email to the court. Um, but the only time what the board does becomes public is when we file in the Court of Judicial Discipline, and then it's a public docket like any other court would be. Is that a pretty good answer, Judge Becker? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, in, in, indeed. It is absolutely, the, everything that the Court of Judicial Discipline, everything filed before the court is, is available uh, as, a, as, a public, um, as a public docket. It is a, it is a court um, that looks uh, and feels and functions very much like the courts that all of you are familiar with in your local uh, local counties. Right. It just has a very specialized jurisdiction. Correct. So um, just if we can just go to the next slide, I want to talk to you a little bit about who serves on the Judicial Conduct Board because in watching the comments that were coming up, I, I did see a comment about, well, how can, how can the board or any Judicial Conduct Board um, be fair uh, if they're making determinations about their friends and acquaintances and colleagues? Well, th there's a basic misconception in that question, an assumption that's incorrect, that the board is made up of a, of a host in our case, in Pennsylvania's case, 12 people. They don't necessarily know the judges that they are making determinations about. And in fact, if they do know the judge and believe that they cannot be impartial, they have an absolute duty to recuse from participating in the matter with the board. But to help you understand this better, I have this slide that shows you. The way you get on the Pennsylvania Judicial Conduct Board is you can be appointed by the governor or you can be appointed by the Supreme Court. So half our members come from the governor, half come from the Supreme Court, you, no more than half can be from the same political party. Um, if you look at the breakdown, the governor appoints a common pleas court judge to the board, two attorneys, three non-lawyers. The Supreme Court appoints an appellate court judge to the board, not including a Supreme Court judge, a magisterial district judge, an attorney, and three non-lawyers. They get four-year terms, so our board is changing constantly. The terms are not aligned in terms of the years. So, you know, at any on any given month, we can we can be losing a member and gaining a member. It's just completely staggered. Um, so, if you look at the next slide, 
what what does the Judicial Conduct Board look at when it's making decisions about uh, whether or not there's misconduct going on? Well, we look at a couple of things. If we are talking about a magisterial district judge, we're looking at the rules governing standards of conduct of magisterial district judges. If you want to look at those rules for Pennsylvania, you can look at the Judicial Conduct Board's website and you, the, the rules are there for you to look at or you can do a little research and find them that way. If we're talking about a judge who is above a magisterial district judge, which I think some states might call that a justice of the peace. Um, but at any rate, if you're looking above that level, if we're considering conduct above that level, which would be any judge above an, an MDJ all the way up through and including the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, then we're looking at the code of judicial conduct. Those two um, statutory authorities are very similar, in fact, almost identical. There are just a couple of differences um, related to primarily magisterial district judges can be law, can, can practice law in Pennsylvania. So there, there are some slight differences controlling their conduct when they are practicing law while being a sitting judge. The board also looks at the Pennsylvania Constitution, which lays out some rules for judicial conduct. One of the most notable is found in Article 5, Section 18, which talks about a judge bringing, uh, conducting him or herself in a manner that brings disrepute upon the entire judiciary. That is probably the uh, toughest finding that uh, the Court of Judicial Discipline can find in a case involving a judge because when the court finds that we've established that the judge brought disrepute upon the judiciary, um, often uh, a collateral consequence may be that the judge will lose their pension. That's, there are a couple of other things that have to happen, but generally that disrepute coming out of the Constitution is a pretty big deal. The board will also look at orders and decisions of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. One good example is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court um, has established a policy called the Unified Judicial Systems Policy on Non-Discrimination and, I believe, Sexual Harassment. It, it is the sexual harassment policy of the Unified Judicial System. And because it's a Supreme Court order, it is also something that judges have to abide by because part of their rules say they have to obey all Supreme Court orders. So, so we also deal with sexual harassment issues raised within the judiciary. And then of course we look to decisions of the Court of Judicial Discipline that apply to all judges. Next slide, please. So the question is who can file a complaint? I did see a comment from somebody saying that they recently listened to um, the director of their state's judicial conduct board and heard that director say that uh, that state doesn't accept complaints from citizens because they're just gonna complain about the decision. So I, I can't imagine what state that came from because I do go to national conferences once a year and I can't imagine any director of a state uh, board saying that. I will tell you this, in Pennsylvania, first of all, there's no standing rule. By that, I mean, um, within the law, there's a rule generally that to come to court, to, to be heard in court, you need to, generally speaking, have standing. You have, you have to be somehow involved in this matter. With judicial conduct, that is not the case in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, anyone can complain about a judge's conduct. And that can be someone who sat in the courtroom. It can be someone who was told by their neighbor down the street that the judge did something. Anyone can complain about judicial conduct. How do they do that? They send a complaint to my office, to the Judicial Conduct Board. They can send that anonymously. We will consider those. They can send it with their name on it. It will remain confidential unless and until we have to file a complaint in the Court of Judicial Discipline. I can also uh, submit complaints regarding judicial conduct. That is often used if I see a newspaper article, thank you to the media, about a judge conducting him or herself in a certain way. If, if I read that article and determine that there might be a problem there, I can 
start an investigation as the chief counsel. So we don't have to wait for the public to complain to us. Um, and as indicated, we can, and I said, we can take anonymous complaints. I will say that with anonymous complaints, we don't automatically begin an investigation. We check in with our board first. Often anonymous complaints simply don't contain enough information for us to proceed. So we'll check with our board. Do you really want us to investigate this? Is there enough information? But just going back um, to what whoever heard a chief counsel say somewhere in the United States, when we receive a complaint, regardless of who it's from, we investigate it. We're constitutionally mandated to do so, and, and we take that very seriously. Now, the extent of the investigation will be dependent on the nature of the allegations. So, for example, um, frequently uh, people will complain to the board about, and they'll say it in all different ways, but what they're saying is the judge made the wrong decision. And generally speaking, that is not misconduct. That's what we call legal error. They're alleging to us that the judge made a mistake. The judge made a wrong decision. Um, often that will be couched in terms of something like, the judge is biased against me. And look, I can prove that because he decided against me or she decided against me. Well, that, that's kind of a bootstraps argument. You lost because you lost. You didn't lose. You, you don't have evidence that you lost because the ju judge was biased against you. And that's not to say we don't look. We'll read transcripts, we'll interview witnesses, we'll look for any indication that perhaps the judge was biased against the individual who lost. But, but the overarching principle here is just because you lost doesn't mean there was misconduct. So there, you know, we do dismiss our board a huge number of complaints on that basis because there's, there's really no misconduct even alleged. It's, it's, someone who's unhappy with the results of their their case and they believe that's misconduct it is not um, hey, hey melissa if I, if I can interrupt could you just could you just share with, with everyone roughly how many complaints you get in a year just to just to help people figure out the scope of of what your office does and and i think you'll tell us that a lot of there's a lot of complaints that come in or things that you investigate that that don't kind of proceed down the path for, for the very reason that you just described. Sure, absolutely. Um, last year we received about, I think it was 948 complaints. And uh, I think we filed one in the court of judicial, judicial discipline. There was another one filed, but it's, it's involving a judge committing a crime that's handled a little bit differently. Um, of those 948 complaints, I, we have an annual report that anyone can see, it's on our website, but if you look at the annual report, you'll see that the vast majority of those 948 complaints were dismissed because they were alleging legal error. They weren't really alleging, or we found no evidence of anything more than legal error. Um, the, the ones that are not dismissed because they're only alleging legal error are cases, um, and I'll get to that in a later slide, that. Um, we did an investigation and we determined that the evidence doesn't support the allegation of judicial misconduct, um, or we did reprimand the judge in some way. And I will get to that in a later slide, uh, those other ways that we deal with uh, when we find judicial misconduct. So going to the next slide, um, the complaint forms, that's an easy slide. The complaint forms, if you want to file one, are on our website. We are working in the dark ages here. If you print out a complaint and fill it out and send it to us, we will look at it. Don't bother emailing it to us. We do not accept them by email. You can hand deliver it. You can put it in the United States mail, but we do not accept emailed complaints. Um, I can tell you that from my perspective, that's a good rule because I think that generally speaking, people need a little bit of a cooling off period before they type out that complaint. I've learned that in my personal and, and professional life that a 24 hour rule is a good rule. And so in this case, we kind of, um, kind of force the 24 hour rule on complainants in that they have to fill it out and they have to address it and put a stamp on it and get it to us that way rather than accepting them by email. In the next slide, what you'll see, um, oh, you can also call us to get a complaint form if you want one. 
And the next slide, <laughs> that's the complaint form. As you can see, it's really simple. Give us as much information as you can. Um, anything you give us speeds up our process a little bit. And then on the second page, which I don't think I attached here, the second page of our complaint form uh, just asks you to give us a brief description of what you think the misconduct was. You do not have to write a legal brief for us. In fact, you're wasting your time if you do. Um, so just tell us what you think went wrong and, and we'll work from there. So in the next slide, um, let's get into the meat a little bit. What do we do when we get a complaint? Every single complaint that we receive gets assigned to an attorney in this office. We have six attorneys, including me. Every single complaint gets investigated in some manner. Now, that might be the investigation could be as simple as reading the docket entries, reading the complaint that's been uh, submitted to us. That, that may be the investigation because if someone is alleging delay, for example, an individual who's been convicted of a crime is alleging that uh, there was delay in their proceedings, we can look at a docket and almost uh, frequently determine whether or not there was any delay. And if there's not, according to the docket, then that's a dismissal. The person is uh, misunderstanding the law. Um, another thing that we do uh, to investigate a complaint avenues available to us. Um, we can send letters of inquiry to judges. That's just the basic correspondence with the judge saying, this is what we found and we're asking you to explain some of this. Uh, we can interview witnesses and judges and we can depose witnesses and judges. We do that quite frequently. We have four investigators. They're spread out across the state. They, they take care of interviews for us. If we depose a judge or a witness, we bring them into our office and depose them here. Um, let's see. Okay. So that would be, those things are preliminary investigations. They can occur at any time in our investigative stages, depending on what the attorney thinks is necessary. In Pennsylvania, uh, our rules of procedure require that, um, if, if we're going to go to court, we need to have given the judge a notice of full investigation, which is a formal notice that we're investigating what we're investigating and giving the judge an opportunity to respond to it. That's the notice of full investigation. Um, we can also ask a judge to uh, take a physical or mental health examination if we believe that there's evidence that mental or physical health are causing problems for the judge. Those are, those are things that we can require the judge to do. At all steps along the way, judges in Pennsylvania are required to cooperate with disciplinary authorities, meaning us. And if they don't, that's a violation of their uh, code of ethics. So it's built into their code of ethics that they cooperate with us. And they take that very seriously. I, in seven years, I remember going to the Commonwealth Court on one occasion to enforce a subpoena and, and every other matter the judges have cooperated. After the attorneys have completed a preliminary inquiry and or um, asked and been given permission to send out a notice of full investigation, we will make a recommendation to our board as to what we think happens next. So we can tell, we can recommend to our board that the matter be dismissed because we haven't found supporting evidence of any kind of judicial misconduct. So a large majority of our cases are just a plain dismissal, either as legal error or not enough evidence or no evidence of judicial misconduct. The next step up is a dismissal with a letter of caution. And that is exactly what it sounds like. It's a letter to the judge cautioning the judge to review a particular rule or rules because, and then we'll lay out the facts for the judge. In this instance, it looked like you came very close to violating the rule, or even in some instances you have violated the rule, but there are mitigating circumstances, which might be something like it's the one and only time it's ever happened for the judge, the judge is new to the bench, or the judge has been on the bench for a long time and has never had a problem in the past, and we don't see that there's going to be a problem in the future. In situations like that, we've almost invariably had a response from the judge in a deposition or through a notice of full investigation in which the judge is indicating, I understand what I did wrong and it won't happen again. Um, beyond that, we can go to the next level, which is a dismissal with a letter of counsel. This, this is actually private, generally speaking, discipline for the judge. We call a letter of counsel discipline because 
if the judge ever ends up in front of the court of judicial discipline on any other matter, the letter of counsel acts sort of like a prior, prior criminal history mm -hmm. um, for a judge. We can present that to the court of judicial discipline as evidence at the sanction hearing in another matter, or as evidence that, hey, the judge has been engaged in this kind of conduct in the past and has not apparently learned from it. Um, we can also seek dismissal of a complaint after we've gone through rehabilitative diversion. So this is the board's version of probation. We will occasionally put, the board will put a judge on a type of probation where we're asking them to do certain things to correct whatever we found to be wrong. And after they've done that, then we'll seek a dismissal. It might be a dismissal with a letter of counsel or letter of caution, but the point being it's handled privately. Um, a, a prime example of a good use of that tool is where we have a very new judge who is simply not understanding. Perhaps it, it could be something as simple as certain rules of procedure. We find this with magisterial district judges who do not have to be attorneys in Pennsylvania and yet are judges. And sometimes, sometimes. they don't understand the rules of criminal procedure um, and they may make mistakes. So one, one thing we were seeing frequently and probably will continue to see are magisterial district judges who believe that they can conduct a trial in absentia where there's a, a substantial likelihood of jail time. They're not allowed to do that. There's a rule on that subject, but they don't know that because they are not legally trained. Um, and in situations like that where we, we see repetitive what are essentially legal errors, repetitive errors that are the result of the judge not understanding the law. This rehabilitative diversion or board probation is a great tool because remember, the MDJ, as all judges in Pennsylvania, are elected. So we have to respect the electorate's decisions. They've elected this individual to be a judge. And now what we're trying to do in a situation like that is um, help that judge to understand understand the job and to do what the people elected the judge to do. That's, we're pretty selective about when that is offered. Um, but generally speaking, if, if we find a situation where a judge needs guidance, that's when we're going to go in that direction. We'll usually have a mentor judge working with them. They'll be reporting to us, that sort of thing. The last uh, step there, if we, can, if we do not resolve a complaint in any of the prior matters that I've described, we end up going to the court of judicial discipline where it's very much, it's very similar to filing a criminal complaint, but it's, it's, it doesn't look like a criminal complaint. The procedural rules are very similar to a criminal matter, but the complaint itself looks a little bit more like a civil complaint. You can, again, go on the court of judicial discipline's website to look at them. Um, and then uh, the court of judicial discipline just briefly uh, we go through a process of discovery with the court so, and then we can sometimes stipulate the facts if we can't stipulate to the facts then we end up with a trial the court will hear the the case um it's a panel of judges that hear a case and i see that judge becker seems like he has a question i do have a question well actually <laughs> my question is here's what i here's what i want to do uh in the in the time that remains to us i want to make sure that we can um get back to judge roof um to talk a little bit more about about some of these procedural issues in the federal courts and, and also the concept of recusal and uh if i can get back to um the thought that professor watson um uh, offered earlier about when courts are mysterious, maybe we respect them more. I'm gonna. I, I propose that we leave the court of judicial discipline wrapped in mystery, um, uh, uh, for purposes of of, uh, of 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 allowing this to go to back to Judge Roof with the proviso that that the court of judicial discipline we will make a decision, and and there is there is there is a trial and there is a process. And even in my short time on the court, I have been part of finding judges. I have been part of 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 of, of suspending judges with pay without pay it's it's a, the powers of the court are very extensive and it underscores that this is a this is a procedural system that in pennsylvania at least that has consequences and it's worth reflecting on wherever it is that you are from what that system is um uh in 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 the jurisdiction of interest to you but but with respect to the federal courts which of course uh cover our entire country um but only within the landscape of federal 
uh, but 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 only within the landscape of the federal system. Uh, they have their own very particular way of doing things, um, both as to discipline and also as to recusal. So, Melissa, I'm sorry for um, for uh, stopping this here, but I I just want to make sure Judge Roof can can bring us home. <laughs> I will try very hard because I'm picking up right where you left off, Melissa. Um, I want the um, people that have tuned in today to understand that there is an impeachment process after a disciplinary process in the federal courts as well. Uh, and that impeachment process is not predicated on legal disagreements with the merits of a judge's decision. Legal errors that are committed by lower courts are always addressed in appeals to higher courts in both the state and the federal court systems rather than through impeachment. But impeachment is what everybody thinks about when someone has truly transgressed. And um, yet it's hard to get there because the constitution does not define high crimes and misdemeanors and impeachment as a penalty has historic, historically been limited to extreme circumstances, such as when a judge is accused of accepting bribes, making false statements or committing sexual assaults. And given its limited use, the House of Representatives has impeached only 15 judges since the judiciary was formed in 1789. And of those 15, only eight were convicted by the Senate and removed from judicial office. And we all know that you can be impeached and not convicted by the Senate for the past couple of years. We've seen that in the executive branch. Neither impeachment nor conviction by the legislature precludes penalties through the United States judicial system, however, and an impeached or convicted judge may still face criminal charges or civil liability for the same misconduct. Short of removal, federal judges who violate the code of conduct for federal judges because of the ethics code requirements or commit other misconduct may be disciplined. And that's through the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980, which governs that process. So could I please see the slides up on recusal? And I appreciate that, going back to that. And then after that, I'd like to see the slides up on complaints and discipline. That's disclosure. So the second one on recusal. Uh, thank you. Judicial recusal is where we start trying to be good judges and being viewed as fair and impartial, not only being fair and impartial. Judicial recusal is the process through which a judge relinquishes or disqualifies himself or herself from a case because of perceived or actual bias. Judges often recuse themselves sua sponte, that is on their own, on their own volition, and before anybody asks them. But there is judicial recusal often prompted by a motion for recusal, filed by the litigants or an interested third party. Recusal requirements arise from the following three sources, constitutional rights of due process, statutory and procedural rules that are listed there, and judicial ethics codes, and these are listed. Now, briefly, constitutional rights of due process at the federal level, well, there is no explicit constitutional basis for judicial recusal. Nonetheless, the common law rule require, requires recusal when a judge has direct, personal, substantiary pecuniary interest in a case. And that's been incorporated via the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Moreover, the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court has identified additional instances which, from an objective standpoint, trigger a recusal obligation. Namely, where the probability of actual bias on the part of a judge or decision maker is too high to be constitutionally tolerable. And a case is listed there, Caperton, where they found so. Despite this standard not clearly delineating when a basis bias becomes unconstitutional, such instances that have crossed the theoretical constitutional dividing line include, for example, where a judge who was charged with the authority to try those accused of violating the prohibition laws received a salary supplement for performing judicial duties that were funded from the fines assessed. 
unheard of today, right? It's happened. Where a judge who determined at an earlier proceeding whether criminal charges should be brought then proceeded to try and convict the petitioners on those charges. And I believe he also sentenced them. That's also cited for you. So there are also statutory procedural rules which control federal recusal disputes. And that is what sets up our, our discipline review when there are complaints. Very similar to the state system that Melissa Norton has uh, pre presented to you. And um, at, at first it is uh, allowed to be anonymous and is also keeping the judge anonymous until there is merit found in moving forward. The judge is giving a chance, given a chance to respond. And sometimes that is in, receives a reply from the actual complainant. It is all conducted by the Third Circuit, that is the Circuit Court of Appeals here where I am, but every circuit court has this obligation to investigate and hear all sides of this, and then they will make a decision. If the decision needs to be appealed, it goes to the Judicial Conference Committee, and a special committee will assemble and hear the complaint. So there is a process by which this is done. As to um, the last, I think you've handled all the slides for me. Thank you very much. I did want to tell you something and follow up with what our co-host Chip Becker has said, because Chip has given you a lot of information and he talks so swiftly that sometimes I miss it. But he said something that triggered in me the need to follow up. The United States judicial system is a beacon of light to the rest of the world. I know that from experience. Only a few days ago, I had the Indonesia Constitutional Court here in the courthouse, giving them a day, a study tour to see how we do business here. They were administrators, they were high law clerks, and uh, they wanted to know not just about security and how to file by an ECF paperless docket. They wanted to know what we did in court. And they saw a sentencing by one of my colleagues and they were blown away. They don't know what it is to have a jury trial. I sit as a delegate, I am the lead delegate to the International Association of Judges and I have that by virtue of my position as past president um, of the Federal Judges Association, and I've been involved in international judicial training and study groups for many years. And I just finished submitting a questionnaire to them for the next conference in September in Taiwan. They look to us to answer questions that they have. The questions are devised to make their systems more democratic because you can't be one of the 94 members of the IAJ unless you have a democratic judicial system. And they ask us to just tell us what we do and how we do it. I think that it gets missed entirely by the public and the press, how we are valued for our judicial independence, which is constantly assailed here at home but it's been worse in other countries. They've been locked up for their decisions in Turkey and they've thrown away the keys and no subsistence to their families. And the threats of that all over the world and sometimes killing of judges occurs because of disagreements with their decisions. That can't be how we discipline judges. We should discipline judges from any court on the basis of their misdeeds and if they do something outside of court that warrants criminal charges, they get criminal charges. We've had that happen here in the federal court system and those judges are let go. We have lifetime appointments, but those judges can't continue unless they have a responsibility to the law. So I think we are accountable. It just doesn't look that way sometimes. And I'm hoping that even if the new pending legislation does pass, or if it doesn't pass, that the public will look at what's already online, will see that we don't make decisions based on what stock my husband 
might have bought or sold or transferred to his grandsons. I think it's important that we know how hard judges work in the federal and state systems for the public service that is being rendered. I just wanted to let you know that um, I'm still trying very hard and everybody else that I know is too. But I thank you for this forum. The PMC, Deb, you are amazing at gathering timely topics that really hit the nerve. And I enjoyed uh, presenting this with my co-presenters. Thank you. Great. I think we're out of time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Judge Roof, you have the last word. Thank you very I much. I just said the last word. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so very much.